I'm Keith McCullough and welcome back. For those of you that have put up with uh, me ranting for the last uh, couple segments and now going on to the third, I, I sincerely appreciate it. I understand and I'm empathetic with uh, how much that might take and certainly taking time out of your day is what we appreciate. What, what, I'm, what I'm really excited about in this next conversation is, is having one with an industry veteran who's been there uh, and is not afraid to talk truth. I think that uh, we have a lot of opportunity here in this, um, whatever this part of our cycle time or this part of our lifetime and in this profession, to have truth tellers step up and have the confidence and uh, courage in the case of Bill Cohen to do that. Um, Bill, welcome. Thank you for, for joining me. I appreciate Great. it. Thank you, Keith. Really, it's a, it's a, a long time ago. I guess I was um, I was saying to you just before we went live, uh, I'd met you, and I was I was on Bloomberg somehow. I think I was on uh, I was on the switch, and I had an opportunity to have what is now like a real conversation with no no advertisers or anybody telling me to to, to not go there. But um, yeah, we were talking about House of Cards, I believe. Um, you know, you've written uh, more than a couple books at this point, but I you know. Money and power in House of Cards are, are almost for somebody like me who reads a lot. Um, they're 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 on the on the mantle of required reading. Yeah, and you've never really veered from that path. For people that don't know you, you're an investment banker. Correct me if I'm wrong. For like almost 20 years, uh, and then you did that. So you had like what I like to think I had, which is all my hedge fund practical experience in the industry, um, and and now commenting on the game. Um, that to me was very helpful. Because you know that, that that's very hard to find that practical experience uh, alongside a, a go forward opinion on the business and its structure. Um, wh what just can you can you take a long step back? I know you've been doing it for a while. Like what got you to do that? Well, first let me uh, say how glad I am to be here with you uh, today, and uh, I'm glad you can remember uh, us visiting uh, once upon a time before. Uh, so, you know, Keith, I think the important thing is, uh, that once upon a time, I, uh, I was a journalist, uh, before I was a banker, I was, I'd gone to Columbia journalism school and worked as a, a reporter on a, a daily paper in Raleigh, North Carolina, covering, uh, public schools in Wake County. Uh, then I went back, uh, to Columbia and got my MBA. Uh, and then, you know, headed to, uh, out to Wall Street. And mm. you're, too, you're, you're too young to remember, but in, in May of 1987, when I graduated from Columbia, uh, all you had to do uh, to get a job on Wall Street was to breathe. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they would take anybody at that point. You know, don't forget the, the crash came in October of that year. So in May of that year, it was a, sort of a, a hiring bonanza. Yeah. I actually uh, went uh, and got a job at GE Capital, uh, of all things, financing leverage buyouts. So I went from being a journalist covering public schools in Wake County, uh, North Carolina, through the alchemy of uh, the MBA, uh, ended up uh, coming out and immediately getting a job financing leverage buyouts. That, that tells you really all you need to know <laughs> about sort of uh, the way uh, Wall Street evolved uh, in the in the 1980s, and uh, you know from from there I uh, ended up going to Lazard where I was uh, for six years, and then Merrill Lynch, and then um, the last part of my career was at J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, I was, uh, as we like to say at Puck, uh, defenestrated in January of uh, 2004. Uh, I was, uh, you know, fired by J.P. Morgan Chase for no good reason at all, other than uh, it was in the aftermath of 9-11, and uh, they needed uh, high-priced bodies to take out because uh, the investment banking business uh, collapsed uh, after 9-11 for, you know, three or four years. Uh, they were still trying to integrate the combination of Chase and J.P. Morgan. It was before. Jamie Dimon arrived. Um, and so I was looking around like, what can I do now? Uh, you know, I, I'd spent nearly 20 years as a banker. Uh, I pretty much had it with that. I think uh, banking had sort of had it with me. And um, uh, I thought, well, uh, you know, what can I go back to and rely on? I, I don't want to uh, have a boss. I want to uh, be able to control my own destiny. Uh, I want to have my own equity. Uh, I, I want to do something that's interesting and intellectually challenging. 
Uh, and I had this crazy idea that I could write a book. Uh, so I wrote a book. Uh, I hadn't written anything in 20 years, by the way, since I, I mean, except for stupid PowerPoint presentations, uh, you know, when it came time to go, uh, you know, pitch a client on a new idea or something. Um, and uh, I wrote a book proposal uh, about uh, doing a history of Lazard, where I had, as I said, worked, uh, never, of course, intending to write a book about uh, anything, let alone Lazard. Uh, they, you know, there there only been one other book written about it, uh, Lazard, uh, and it was, you know, maybe uh, 25 or 30 years old. And so uh, I wrote the book proposal. Uh, there was, I conducted a little uh, M&A auction, uh, like I had learned to do as a banker. Uh, <laughs> the book was uh, bought by Doubleday. Uh, I wrote the book. It became a bestseller. It was named the uh, FT Goldman Sachs Business Book of the Year in 2007. Uh, and sort of the, the rest is history. Graydon Carter called me up after that and said, Did I want to write for Vanity Fair, which of course I did. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. It's a, it's a long history, and I'm glad you took the time to, to go through it because, you know, foundationally, a lot's been, you know, you, a lot's been accomplished for you. Um, and your body of work speaks for itself. I think uh, The Last Tycoons, was, that was the other book of yours that I read. That was the Lazard book, correct? That was the Lazard book, right. Right. Um, you know, a lot, you know, so for somebody like me who's just constantly realizing what I don't know, the only way I can learn is by reading somebody else's experience or history, behavioral books, math books, et cetera. So that's very uh, helpful, especially if you're a truth teller. You know, what's happened, it's interesting, I didn't know that. I, I think you, you, you were in Carolina because you went to Duke, correct? Right. All right so you're... Um, What's interesting about that, like today, if I look at the, you know, let's touch on this before we get into the banking business, the lack of integrity, moral compass, there's a lot to talk about here. But the, um, you know, journalism, you know, this clickbait journal, if you're, if you're coming out of a journalism school today, the people that I see covering Wall Street on Twitter, it's like, it's like a joke. I mean, it's, it's, it's like there's, there, there's no respect for history. There's no respect for integrity, truth, transparency, accountability, trust, principles that I always consider core to the Hedge Eye Nation or to what we've built here. Um, what do you think's happened in financial journalism? What I, 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 you know, I, I affectionately call it the old wall and its media, but I think it's as bad as it's ever been. Uh, well, look, I think Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it, these days uh, has you know completely deteriorated um so i mean uh, i i don't know that i can trust anything uh that appears on twitter x uh as being you know qualifying as real journalism uh right. or they even got rid of the links uh last week uh to stories uh so I'm not quite sure that that qualifies um i think you know uh they're you know, it's like everything, uh, Keith. I think there's um, le levels of the game. I think there are people who are, are very, very serious about their uh, uh, financial journalism, investigative uh, journalism. Uh, there are people, uh, obviously, who are very good at, at narrative uh, uh, financial journalism about uh, financial figures. Uh, obviously, we have two recent examples with the Walter Isaacson book about Musk and yep. the Michael Lewis book about uh, Sam Bankman Fried, whether you, you know, uh, th think they did the job or not, you, you know, they are, they were highly uh, readable and entertaining. Um, you know, I, I obviously uh, strive very hard. Um, uh, and, and I think the length of the books, you know, proves it uh, uh, to try to tell a story in full, uh, you know, without fear or favor. Uh, to try to, uh, you know, tell what really happened, wart, warts and all. Um, and I think, uh, you know, obviously the days are gone. You know, one of the reasons, if I could just, um, you know, you know, uh, I, I really wanted uh, to get a, a job at the Wall Street Journal uh, uh, back in the day after I got out of Columbia Journalism School. And I, I aspired to that. That is even why I went back to uh, get my MBA at Columbia, because I figured if I had a MBA from Columbia and a journalism degree at Columbia, the journal would have to hire me. Uh, <laughs> and they never, they never did. They, they really, you know, showed me the yellow card for a long time. But the reason I wanted to go there uh, was because 
um, you know, I, and maybe you remember this, you know, there'd be like a big deal. Uh, KKR would be buy RJ and Arbisco or, you know, uh, Forceman Little would buy Gulfstream or something. And, you know, I always wondered how the hell that happened. What really happened? Who did what to whom? How yeah. did they end up buying that company? And you'd wait a couple of days and then the old Wall Street Journal under the Bancroft family, you know, there'd be this huge takeout and, you know, they'd start on the front page and go deep into the paper about who did what to whom and what the bankers did and what the lawyers did and what the executives did. And I just love that stuff. Yeah. And I don't know why, but I, and I wanted to, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to write those stories. And that's why I wanted to go to the journal. Now, of course, that doesn't happen that way anymore because the Murdoch uh, uh, Wall Street Journal rarely does those big takeouts anymore. Uh, so, you know, I decided I could do it uh, myself since the journal would never hire me uh, to, you know, in, in writing these books. And so I think I've accomplished what I always was hoping to do. Plus, I have uh, equity in the books. I can control my own destiny. I don't have a boss. You know, it's great life. And not having a boss, I'd, I'd uh, double down on that. Obviously, I, I have and I quite enjoy it. And I didn't mean so much like that's why I read books, because, you know, actually this morning I was I was highlighting, you know, uh, that book. I mean, Isaacson did a phenomenal job. Uh, Musk did, I'd argue, who I've been plenty critical of, um, you know, did a phenomenal job giving access to everyone like Taibbi. I mean, um, there there there's 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 a good example of a good, real good piece, a body of work that, you know, 90 percent of the book I didn't I wasn't aware of, you know, where yeah, I can actually I take that. And you agree with that book? You've read it? Totally. Right. I, totally. Mean, I learned things I didn't know. I mean, and, and people have been criticizing Walter for not being hard enough on on, on Musk. And I think uh, Walter did a great job of sort of, you know, letting Musk, you know, hang himself, so to speak, you know, just showing him who showing us who he really is. And the way he behaves towards people and, you know, the way he fires people and is callous and is so demanding and mercurial, you know, I think we, I have a much better understanding of the guy now than than I did before I read that book. And no, that, if the criticism is he wasn't hard enough, of course, people are going to criticize if they don't do the work themselves or write books like you have or I write every day. I mean, and uh, I came a long way, too. I mean, my first paper in New Haven was deemed ungradable by the Eng English Lit Department. And now Wall Street reads my rants every day. But I mean. Um, it, it, it is a body of work that, that people should read, and it was plenty critical, and you know, it is what it is. What I'm most critical of, though, is what you went to at the end of that answer, which is the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, CNBC. Like these places, it took Hedge ITV to reveal Sam Bankman fraud, me and Cahotes, um, oh, who, who are two. Classic. Like a two classic. troglodytes, right? And then, and then all of a sudden, Tucker Carlson's like, wow, I'm jumping on that one puts it on Fox, and we're like, thanks. We've only been talking about it for like months. <laughs> but Wall Street, under the plain eye of the, their own advertising dollars that SBF was perpetuating, you know, just, it, like to me, it's, it's, it's disgusting. Like that, that part of it, man, I just still, like just that one in particular, like you can criticize Elon for who he is as a person. That sucks compared to that level of fraud right under your own eyes and getting paid for it. I mean, to me, that's what I meant by journalism today on Wall Street. I didn't mean all the great work that's being done independently by Taibbi included in yourself. Um, what do you, where do you think this is going? Well, I think, I think, I think what you're alluding to without quite saying it is, you know, there are people who are very focused on being access journalists. Um, and then if, you know, if, if you want to make sure you have that access all the time, then you're going to be wary of offending anybody sometimes you have to offend people <laughs> sometimes you have to uh have people who you write about uh no longer want to talk to you which pretty, happens to me pretty much all the time uh, <laughs> uh, but that's just the way it is i mean you know there's a great book uh one of my favorite books that janet malcolm uh, wrote uh, called the journalist and the murderer and it talked about the the dance, the pas de deux that a journalist does with his or her, uh, you know, source or subject of what he or she is writing about. And it's a, it's a seduction, it's a romance, uh, it's a strange uh, but fascinating uh, 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 
time that you spend together with somebody who you're writing about, if, if they'll let you, if they'll even let you. Um, obviously, if they don't let you, it's almost easier to write about them. But if they do, then, you know, you you uh, begin to, um, you know, really sort of understand what they're all about. Uh, and then you can, I think, write uh, a better in a more informed way about them. But you have to be careful careful very very careful not to get quote embedded not to become seduced by them uh you know you have to have the guts at the end of it all to to explain what really happened and not pull any punches if you need to and so th that's the point of i think uh, uh janet malcolm's wonderful small book which i recommend to everybody if you mm. really want to understand the relationship between journalists and their sources. Yeah, I think that that's um, a critical point. I mean, I try to read a book uh, every 10 days. That's my pace, mm. and it's a hard one to keep, but wow. it keeps me away from the, people like you. Like the bullshit, right? And, and I said I, wasn't, I probably wasn't gonna touch on this, but because you just said you have to be uncomfortable touching things that make you uncomfortable uh, for a variety of different reasons, I'm gonna do that right now. I said that I may or may not ask you about Apollo. So, um, there's a situation, right? I mean, so I just read Gretchen Morganson's book. Again, another book, and I'm not going to evaluate it the same way that I did Isaacson's work. I would say, though, in terms of the, kind of that 80-20 rule, at least 80% of what's in that book, I had no idea either. And it certainly wasn't, uh, while I have plenty of uh, even friends, but business contacts at Apollo, KKR, you go down the line, you know, here's a human being that got depicted in, in quite um, a negative way by Gretchen Morganson, and, and you're um, evidently, uh, you've been interviewing them and uh, you're, you're working on that. Right, so my, uh, my new book is about uh, Apollo. Uh, uh, you know, my last book about GE came out about a year ago, so mm -hmm. I've been um, working on this book. Uh, I've been very fortunate uh, that I've had good access. Um, I've been able to interview Leon. I've been able to interview Mark Rowan. I've been able to interview Josh Harris and a, a number of the other uh, Apollo executives. So it's it's going to be both a, a history of the firm, uh, and it's a fascinating history because obviously they all worked at Drexel uh, when it blew up, and then they went out on their own and created a private equity firm. But of course, uh, that's since evolved into a uh, major uh, private credit uh, behemoth uh, of the whatever 600 billion of assets they have under management now, something like you know 450 billion or so is private credit. Epic. Uh, yeah, and so there's a not only a fascinating story of uh, that firm and how they evolved and where they are now. Um, there's also uh, a great story about succession at the firm. And of course, there's the story of, of Leon and uh, Jeffrey Epstein and, you know, his involvement with Jeffrey and and how that sort of cost him his job at, at Apollo. Um, and uh, we're going to get into all of that um, mm -hmm. in, in this book. And uh, but, you know, I'm going to tell it like it is, uh, you know, I'm, um, you know, that's that's what I do. So. Um, I'm, I'm very glad that they're uh, agreeing to participate, and uh, I, I'm going to be fair and honest about uh, you know that part of it. And uh, you know, I think it's uh, you know if you look at it objectively, uh, what Mark Rowan has done in the last two years uh, running Apollo, it's been nothing short of astounding. Right. Uh, uh, it, you know, the part of this book, uh, unlike you know most of my other books, I just sort of look back and and they're sort of historical in nature, which is fine. I mean, they're books I like to read, and that's why I write books that I like to read. Uh, but I think one of the things I'm going to do in, in this book uh, is to uh, try to explain to people uh, how Apollo is kind of leading the charge about where Wall Street is headed at this point. You know, the old uh, Wayne Gretzky, you know, skate to where the puck's going to be. And I think that's what uh, uh, Mark Rowan and Apollo are doing now. And I don't think people even... Uh, have picked up on it. I, I noticed that, you know, uh, maybe two months ago, I wrote a piece in the uh, FT uh, about what sort of Apollo was up to. And I've noticed the rest of the media, financial press has started to pick up on that a little bit and begin to write about what, what Apollo is up to. Um, but it's really, it's, it's an amazing story. And I'm glad 
you know, I feel privileged to be able to to interview these guys and to write it. And but you know, it'll be the book will be what it'll be. It'll be an honest appraisal of that firm and the people in it and um, where they find themselves now. Well, I think that that I mean, it's it's very well timed. I mean, of course, uh, Gretchen's book is called The Plunderers, and it and it and it depicts you know private equity as a component of America as a very like, kind of like a dark problem, almost like how I thought about Hedgeye in the beginning. I was like, look, I've been working in the hedge fund business my whole, pretty much my whole career. I want to put Hedgeye, like some transparency on that and show people that while that depiction has plenty of fair criticism, there, there is a lot of good that goes on if a hedge fund is well structured, has a good process, has good transparent, accountable people. And 15 years later, I, I'm still rolling with that. But um, you know, let, that, me, let me just inter interrupt you there for a minute. I mean, that's basically the exact same thing that, that I try to do, Keith, uh, you know, with, with Wall Street and, and hedge funds and private equity and private credit. You know, like you, I, you know, I worked close to 20 years as an investment banker. Um, so, you know, I wrote a book called Why Wall Street Matters uh, after the financial crisis because I thought, you know, everybody was dumping on Wall Street uh, to excess. So politicians were trying to make hay. Uh, you know, uh, bashing Wall Street. And I just thought it was important to remind people about, yeah, there, there are things that Wall Street does that are plenty bad uh, and, <laughs> and to excess and need reform. And I, and I write about that and I, and I call them out on that. But I also believe it's important to explain to people what Wall Street does that is useful and right and essential. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't want to live in a world uh, without uh, a what Wall Street does for us every day without us even noticing it. Yeah. You know, providing capital 24 by seven, wherever it's uh, best and highest use is or where people can pay for it. And the things that we just take totally for granted that are enabled through uh, you know, the capital that Wall Street, the capital, the advice, the trading, the money management, or whatever it is that Wall Street provides. So let's just, you know, let's just keep things in perspective. So, I mean, Gretchen is, is a friend of mine. I like Gretchen. Uh, you know, I have a different perspective, obviously, on, on Wall Street than she does, having worked, you know, there for 20 years. Maybe, you know, I, I have that bias, but at least, uh, you know, I think I've been uh, honest in in saying what it does right and what it does wrong. Yeah, I mean, Gretchen uh, Morganson, by the way, I'm on the record. She was one of the first people to highlight well before Tucker Carlson, our work on SBF being a fraud. Right. Uh, she's she's as courageous and, uh, and as hardworking as anybody out there that's got some miles under that's her right. belt. And um, that doesn't mean that she gets everything right either. I mean, so what I love about what you're doing is, first of all, you're getting, you know, player one access, whereas I believe she didn't interview uh, Leon at all. Um, right. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it doesn't really matter. No, but that's right. But there's a big difference. And I think that that's where we need to get. Like, People are sick and tired of one-way pigeonholing into a political partisan spot or into a, a narrative on private equity or into a narrative on a hedge fund or whatever. Even Elon, I came out of that reading that book on Elon Musk, I, I started liking him a little bit more because I stopped thinking about him as Elon, the human being, who I'm, I will thank God never be. I mean, I'm, let's just start with I'm happily married with four kids uh, and want to keep it that way. But <laughs> it's just, you know, I don't judge him for having however many kids or however many wives. And I, I, I read that book and I said, wow, OK, didn't know that. Um, that's not me. But he's pushed a lot of things forward with a lot of force that a lot of human beings wouldn't have done and accomplished things in life you know, and for humanity that have really helped. So I think that, and again, I'm just talking on my own channel here, that the way that you and I are talking is a much more, I think, tangible way forward for you know, the population in general that's just pissed off, man. Like, they're just mad. Because if all you're going to do is pitch one side, it makes people mad. Yeah, I, to, I mean, I totally agree with you. I mean, the, 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 things are not black and white. Things are subtle. There's nuance. And we really owe it to each other to take the time to try to understand what people who we may not necessarily agree with have to say uh, and listen to them, listen to their side. You know, I'm going to I'm going to listen to what Leon Black has to say about Jeffrey Epstein. I'm going to take it into serious consideration yep. and when I write my book. You should. I, I owe him that. I, I owe anybody I owe anybody that, uh, you know, I'm going to see what 
you know, he says, and if it if it makes sense to me, and if you want to criticize me for that, fine. You know, if you don't like the book I write, write your own book. <laughs> It's, it's so true, and with no access at all to their team. And I've had, you know, full disclosure, which is why I didn't want to talk about it, but we're talking about it, Apollo. You know, like, I, we work with people there. There are some very good people that have, to your point, really changed Wall Street in terms of where it's been. Ooh. And I agree with you. I mean, it's, it's not like it starts today with that view. I mean, really coming out of the pandemic, what Apollo did uh, in particular was, you know, it was just groundbreaking. I mean, they just kept and pushing it forward. around corners, absolutely. Right. Mark and, Rowan saw around a corner and he executed on it. And, you know, it's brilliant. Yeah. It's, it's, it's brilliant. And you gotta give him credit for that. Yeah. And But that's what makes this a great story because it's more than just that. It's the drama between the three founders. It's the drama that, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, what happened, you know, they had a great thing going at Drexel and then and that blew up. And then somehow they pulled themselves out of it. And, you know, the whole Drexel, uh, you know, uh, uh, diaspora is quite an extraordinary group of people. And, uh, you know, I used to compete uh, against Drexel. And, um, you know, now I find myself working often with people. I did find myself when I was a banker working with people who worked at Drexel. It, it was an amazing group of people. And I think, you know, I, I'm just thinking, I think it's a great story to yep. be able to uh, show how this one group who worked at Drexel, what, what they ended up doing and building something important and powerful and, and that now uh, the rest of Wall Street is, is copying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, and to be clear, like, and balanced, you know, if you go to any investment bank, any hedge fund, any private equity firm, there are going to be some cockroaches and people that make your, you know, your hair stand up on end if you have any principal orientation to your life. So, I want to be clear on that, but there are also uh, good things going on. I want to get your, I, I highlighted this to uh, Bianco in, in the last conversation, but I don't know if you saw this, um, like you said, on, on X, you don't, that's not where you spend most of your time, but this thing from Dana White went completely viral. Um, and, you know, Dana White from, from UFC, um, and he said, Two of the most hated people on the planet right now, I don't know if we can put the graphic up, but two of the most hated people on the planet right now are politicians and the media. They're trying to divide us. They're lying to us. I don't care what they do. They're not as powerful and they're not as influential as they think they are. And he said it in a way that really resonated with the people, Bill. And I think sometimes you just need to have somebody who's not from Wall Street to deliver the message. What do you think? Well, I mean, I, 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 well, taking politicians first, um, obviously, again, you can't make blanket blanket statements, but there are obviously some politicians who have high high integrity and try to do the right thing. And then there are a bunch, and unfortunately, it seems like the preponderance these days in Washington uh, that are, are dishonorable and do not care about doing the right thing for the American people and just want to do the thing that will advance their own careers uh, at the expense of, you know, really governing this country and, and and encouraging us to beat each other's throats, which I really find despicable. Okay, so that's politicians. The media, um, geez, you know, my experience, you know, now 20 plus years being a member of the media is everybody <laughs> that I work with and have been involved with is pretty uh, high integrity and pretty honorable but you know i know that that feeling is out there that somehow the media is responsible i mean uh for sort of fomenting uh the divisiveness and and some of the hate um and isn't really helping um and and i, and I know that and i see that sometimes and it does bother me um I think social media is particularly bad. I think, yeah. you know, Twitter X really just, you know, foments it. I don't know why Elon di did what he did. I don't, I don't know why he felt the need to to buy this and, and and change it and whatever it is that he's trying to do to it. Um, but 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 I would guess I would say Keith that the people that I know and deal with regularly in the media are are, are you know are high integrity and try to do the right thing and want to do the right thing. And, and I, I, don't, I know that that other feeling is out there, that somehow the media is to blame. 
you know, Marshall McLuhan, whatever, said the medium is the message. And I know that sometimes people like to blame the messenger. Uh, you know, I get blamed a lot and criticized a lot for the things that I write. And I'm just being literally reportorial. <laughs> and people don't necessarily like a mirror held up to them uh, in public. And, uh, you know, I, I can understand that. Um, but, you know, that is our job is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And um, <laughs> I, 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 I hope we can somehow have a better reputation than politicians. But I, I feel like you're right. We're probably both down there in the gutter these days. Well, I mean, yeah, especially if you take a general you know, stab at it and you put it inside of like Neil Howe's The Fourth Turning, which is the generational occurrence of people just getting tired with both parties and, a, and an aging you know, leadership class or the elites. Uh, have you read, by the way, End Times by, because, you know, Neil Howe, who I'm sure you know, um, you know, The Fourth Turning is here. He just published that. He's, he's my partner here at Hedge Eye, but, um, so I it's probably- on, it's, on my, it's on my list to do, but I, I certainly agree with the, the premise that, that uh, in my lifetime, uh, I've seen a deterioration in the way people view our institutions. You know, you know, administration after administration, I, I, I've often thought about writing a book called, you know, 1963, which starts with the Kennedy assassination and mm -hmm. then goes through my entire, uh, up to this day, you know, uh, 60 years later, uh, of the continuous deterioration in the way people view our institutions, the way our, pol our politicians have uh, disappointed and sometimes deceived us. Uh, and um, I think it's sort of led to this general uh, uh, feeling of despair that we all feel in this country sort of on a daily basis and wish we're somehow different. But, uh, you know, it's like turning around a battleship at this point. We all hope that the next person who comes along will pull us out of this despair, but, uh, but it doesn't really seem to be happening. And it, the despair just gets uh, larger and larger the hole deeper and deeper, and I don't know where it ends. Um, I don't know what Mr. Fourth Turning uh, says <laughs> where it ends, but um, I've, I've watched it for the last 60 years. It's real, it's palpable, it's happening. I don't know what the narrative would be, but I, but I feel like this is a real subject that we need to grapple with. Yeah, it ends when people die. I mean, I don't mean like through um, un unfortunate wars or otherwise. It's just they just run out of time and space. They can't talk anymore. They can't do what they do. I mean, that's the whole point. I mean, if I'm looking at the, the critical, um, you know, being critical of establishment you know, economists or the Fed or Wall Street's lack uh, thereof in, in criticizing any of the above, I mean, it's just what it is. I mean, if you win a no Ben Bernanke, I think uh, last year on this day won his Nobel Prize. I mean, for bullshit, according to me. I mean, you think Fox is going to or, or Fox Business, CNBC, or Bloomberg is going to call me on to talk about that? No, they black. They all of those firms have blackballed Hedge Eye. Think about that. Like that. That's the media that I'm talking about. That is not what you answered with. Which is, I appreciate that. I mean, if you're in the media, you choose your company, right? Like, there's a big difference between. Bill Cohen having a conversation with Gretchen Morganson and Keith McCullough talking to the mooch. Like, I mean, eh -eh, that's not going to work. Right? I was at Fox in the room before him, before you know, mornings with Maria, and I'm like, no, thank you. Like, that's my choice. Right? That's the part uh, of the uh, movie. Keith, I'm not their favorite. I mean, I, I, like, you know, Mark Cahodes and I have talked about this too. I mean, I'm not their favorite person either. I've written critical articles about uh, Maria uh, Bartiromo. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, uh, the former uh, 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 national uh, economic advisor to Trump, who, who's back on Fox with his own show. I'm spacing on his name. Cudlow. Uh, yeah. Cudlow. Uh, I, I wrote. Uh, I, I used to be a regular on CNBC, and then I wrote an article critical of uh, Jim Cramer and all of his uh, <laughs> <That's it. laughs> crazy uh, recommendations uh, and how bad they've been, and yet he still has. Uh, airtime every night on CNBC. Well, that was the end of my uh, contract with uh, CNBC. So, uh, look, I mean, if, if don't ha have me on TV, don't have me on TV. I don't really care. Uh, you know, I think it's more important to uh, you know just be honest about when you know people are you know misbehaving or being disreputable 
or or leading. I mean, you know what Jim Cramer does, and people listen to him, and they lose a lot of money, and that doesn't seem right to me. I don't know why CNBC would promote that. Well, we've done some research on that, and um, it is now officially uh, well and beyond Seinfeld, the longest running comedy in American history on cable. So it's. Um, yeah, there, there, there are other reasons for it. I think it even starts with the horns and everything else. But um, what, I, what I think the part of the answer is you've already started it, right? Like you said, I don't have a boss. I have, I have Puck. I, you know, Keith has this hedge eye channel. Um, and we're just going to have the conversations with the people that we deem to be credible sources. By the way, I've had credible sources that have turned into complete scumbags. I mean, um, like what Raul Paul did with Real Vision is a disaster for the American people or people broadly that were getting pumped all this crypto crap. I mean, and I had to reverse on that. I'm like, okay, I thought he was fine. He's not fine. I mean, it's like, now, I've, uh, so you're, we're never going to get all of our sources right. We're never going to get, you know, we're never going to get all of the people that we engage with right. Um, but I think what we can do is provide, you know, different forums and whether they be books, whether they be conversations like this, they, they be like an irreverence of, I don't need to be on that channel, I'll start my own. Um, I think that that at least you know, is a solution, Bill, to a very large problem that just isn't going to go away. And, and they're not going to turn off CNBC. No, 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 no. The, the, nobody's, nobody's turning off CNBC. No, nobody's, I mean, you know, uh, uh, as speaking of Seinfeld, you know, Seinfeld, I mean, you know, when they were trying to get their show and they, talking to the head of the NBC and he, and they're saying, you know, uh, you know, why would anybody watch a show about nothing? And George <laughs> says, because it's on TV. And then the ex NBC executive says, not yet it isn't. Uh, but when it's when it's on TV, uh, people will will watch it. I mean, you know, yeah. there used to be three channels when we were growing up. Now there's 300 uh, and people will just click around and watch what's what's ever on there. Uh, you know, I don't know whether it's the opiate of the masses, but it's, you know, uh, it's it's fun. It's easy to do. People get tired at the end of the day. They want to be entertained. And, you know, that's why, you know, streaming uh, is a great thing. I think the streaming, yeah. uh, 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 the, the product is an amazing product. Who, who I mean, how can you not like sort of watching uh, on your flat screen TV, uh, you know, this great content? Uh, what I find fascinating is it's a, uh, a great product, but a lousy business, uh, at least at this moment. And they've got to figure out how to make it a better business. Only Netflix has figured out how to make it a good business. Everyone else can't figure out how to make it a good business. But it's a great product. So this is a rare example where you have a great product, and it's a lousy business. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm assuming they're going to figure it out somehow. And I think what that means is we're all going to have to pay pay more if we want to continue to have that product come into our homes. Yeah, part of it, you know, that's part of Elon's plan once you get to the end of the book. I mean, uh, you know, in a maybe not clear way, but which may be by design or not. But, you know, I, was, I had dinner last night with a, a gentleman who most people might know, but he, um, he generated, I think at his peak, 150 million in newsletter revenues. Right? That's a pretty prolific writer, um, or the business was, uh, and he was a big part of it. And, you know, we we're talking about this and it's like, you know, because he grew up like you and I grew up, just like you start writing in 2004, I start writing in 2007 and into 08 and writing like that's how I established that was my Trojan horse. We had to build these like get through the JP Morgan email spam filter thing so that I can antagonize people to open up this thing and read it. You know, like that has been not usur usurped or you replace, but it's been augmented by video streams where we see it. I can tell you right now, there's going to be at least two to three clips of what you and I are talking about that we know how to make it go viral. It's going to go viral. It's going to be three to six minutes. Like you said, people are going to sit there on the couch and let, that's, they like to consume it that way. It requires no work, no thought. But if you have to read an 800 word essay, that takes a little work. <laughs> or an 800 page book. Can you right. imagine what you're asking people to do? But you know, but that, if, if you don't mind me interrupting, which I did last night as well, which I have a problem with sometimes, apologies for that, but that point, if you haven't written a book, if you don't have the experience, you don't have the context, that three to six minute clip doesn't have any value relative to those that do, right? Because you have a lot of value, like when you speak, 
every word, you can see how you speak. I mean, very you know, composed and calculated in the words that you use. It's, it is a super high premium clip because of every, all the written work and all the research you've done. Apologies to, for the interruption. No, no, no. I mean, I, I think a, a book is incredible value. I mean, if you think of how the, the, the amount of hard work two to three years at least that goes into a, a serious nonfiction book uh, between the interviewing, the research, the writing, the fact checking. Uh, and you know, it's not enough to write a book. You have to sell a book. You have to, you know, go, go on TV. If they'll have you, uh, you'll know, do the, do podcasts, do whatever it is you have to do to sell a book. It's a lot of work and you know what you charge, my GE book, uh, I think, is forty dollars. I mean, you get many, many, many hours of entertainment and knowledge uh, and useful information uh, for that forty dollars. I mean, you could you could pee forty dollars away getting a gallon of gas now. So, uh, you know, a book is a great value, if I may say. It's one. Uh, of the, it's one of the things that you know isn't you know inflating like you know like crazy. I mean, it's. I agree. I mean, and then the ability to listen to a book. I don't know how many of your books you've gone back and been the author. Like you've read it on Audible. Have you done that or no? That's a lot. No, of I haven't done that because uh, they're very long. So that would take a long time. Yeah, Neil Howe told me he's like this is he's like because I have my book. I'm thinking about redoing it and uh, or augmenting it with a new part of the book. And uh, and he's like, you have no idea how long it takes to read that bloody book. <laughs> but, you know, that's a tremendous value, whether it be um, reading a book, Ken Dryden reading his old, you know, Montreal Canadiens hockey history book. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, when you actually hear the author intonate and express, like, the points of the, you, it, that, that to me is that super value. Something. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, Quick question. The uh, by the by the way, we're I'll take. Uh, uh, there's a couple good questions here. If you have questions for Bill, pop them into the queue, and uh, if they're if they're good with um, relevance here, I'll ask them. Um, this question from uh, Zeno Heilman: uh, Do you think that AI will affect journalism in a way that mediocre pieces will strongly lose value? You know, since AI can do that. Well, on the other hand, it's heavily enhancing the value of unique and authentic thoughts and reporting. So uh, I have two two thoughts about. Uh, this whole AI phenomenon. Uh, number number one, which I find very disturbing, is that uh, the, these AI companies have like hoovered up a number of my books into them uh, to use as the basis for whatever it is they're doing. Really? Without asking me, without consulting with me, without obviously compensating me or my publishers. Uh, and this isn't just me. This is authors everywhere. Uh, their books are getting hoovered up uh, into the uh, you know AI uh, machine and then spit out however they use them without compensating the people who spent you know I just went over spent told you how how much blood sweat and tears go in, into making writing a book and for it to get hoovered up without compensation is completely unacceptable so so that has to stop uh, I think that uh, will uh, stop somehow I mean you know as ironically you know we've just had this uh, writers uh, strike in Hollywood, and they've they've gone after uh, the streamers. Uh, you know, I think the streamers, who, of course, as I've said before, don't know how to make money from streaming except for Netflix. And so, uh, arguably, that's kind of the wrong focus of their ire. They really need to go after the tech companies: Google, uh, Microsoft, uh, uh, Facebook, Meta. Uh, that are uh, on the cutting edge uh, and spending billions of dollars on artificial intelligence, which are hoovering up our content, our intellectual property, without proper compensation. So that's one thing I feel about uh, artificial intelligence, what happened uh, and what's happening. And, and of course, I'm immensely upset about that. Um, the other thing I feel is, you know, I don't, I don't care. I don't care because... Uh, uh, you know, what I do uh, or try to do uh, on a daily basis and then, you know, at Puck and, and other articles I write and, and in my books is completely bespoke. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't think a machine can go, uh, you know, uh, interview uh, Steve Schwartzman uh, and, you know, write about Steve Schwartzman in a nuanced, uh, understandable way. 
uh, you know, I really don't think uh, a machine is going to be able to interview all the people I interviewed <laughs> uh, for my GE book and then write a book about it. So, you know, you have at it. If you want to write, uh, you know, if you want the computer, the machine to write, uh, you know, stupid little articles here and there, uh, <laughs> fine. You know, stupid. that can happen. But they, they are really they are really it. stupid if you're if you have any knowledge on the matter. I mean, matter. I just literally was. Uh, I hope you don't mind. I was. Um, punching into uh, the, the old chat GPT to summarize House, House of Cards, you know, summarize mm. the last tycoons. I mean, it's, mm. brrr, you know, it's just, but you know what? Yeah, that's because they've hoovered up the, the originals. Right, exactly. So, I mean, it's, but the, but the summary kind of sucks, you know, it'll suck compared to having a conversation with the guy himself. I mean, it's, um, or I'll look up economic realities or, you know, just, um, you know, points in economic cycle time and they, it'll just be like dead wrong. I mean, it's um, so it's an interesting thing where the human being is still um, still, uh, you know, like to your point is, is is central to the story and the research and and the context. Um, I, well, as my I, friend Scott Gall Galloway says that, you know, your job is not going to be taken over by, uh, you know, an AI machine. It's going to be taken over by somebody who understands how to a human being who understands how to work with AI. And yep. benefit from AI and take advantage of AI, and and I think he's probably right about that. Yeah, the, where I where I have some efficiencies, but also some struggles, like because I write a 600 to 800 word essay, and I have to be, uh, my clock is like 50 minutes of, of writing time in the morning between six and seven, you know. So I can look things up quickly, but then I realize, okay, a third of these things just aren't true. I might be wasting my time on that. But if I needed the day in 08 when oil went to 147, boom, it's there. I don't have to call my analyst. So there's like you know there's a lot to that if you're a writer and and I, I we're just really getting started. Uh, but I can't end this conversation since you mentioned my uh, my good old buddy Steve Schwartzman. Um, uh, not, but you know same alma mater, all that stuff. I get pushback on it. I get support on it. I mean I've been very we've been very critical as a firm of, of about the disclosures at BREIT and what's gone on in the real estate industry, NAVs, etc. But um, Little different story on the on the uh, on, on the Blackstone side. Do you have any thoughts on that? Like on on the BREIT saga, uh, as I'll call it that, because that's something that is unfinished business here from a research perspective. Um, I, I guess my uh, view on that is in, informed a little bit by conversations I've had a, uh, about it with Jonathan Gray, who is okay. of course uh, Steve's uh, you know number two and is going to be the CEO whenever. Steve decides he's had enough. Um, and John, I, I have great admiration for Jonathan Gray. Uh, I mean, you know, what he tells me, and uh, I, I don't have any reason to doubt it, is that, you know, it's just a sort of a, uh, a function of, of, of timing almost. Yes, uh, there might be some assets inside that REIT that are not performing that well. Uh, if everybody sort of panics, and wants to leave, uh, you know, then uh, that creates sort of a, uh, a spiral downward that, uh, you know, if you just gave it uh, more time and uh, uh, were more patient and la allowed uh, some of the, uh, the real estate assets to recover, that the whole overall uh, fund and the REIT would, would recover as well. So, you know, it's like, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's, you know, I hate to say it, but it's sort of like what, you know, uh, people like, you know, Sam Bankman Freed said, you know, too, if you just, if, 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 if we didn't put this into bankruptcy, uh, you know, then, then the assets, underlying assets would recover. I mean, I don't think in that case he's right, but I do think <laughs> that, uh, cause clearly he's not uh, right about that because he's still $8 billion or appears to have, uh, but I think that sometimes, um, you know, in investors like at Silicon Valley Bank, they all, you know, head for the door at once. And when you do that in a business where the liabilities are uh, can be taken out in 24 hours and the assets are long dated, you know, borrowing short and lending long is a very, very dangerous business. And that is the business of banking. That is the business often of of investing. And um, so, I mean, are there problem assets in that Blackstone REIT? Probably. Uh, there are a lot of, and they've walked away 
from a lot of uh, 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 not a lot, but a number of of, of buildings uh, in in Manhattan and elsewhere, uh, and turned those over to the lenders. And so, you know, they don't. Nobody bats a thousand percent. They have a pretty damn good track record when it comes to real estate. I know the Apollo guys uh, think the world of what uh, the Blackstones be able to accomplish in in real estate. So, uh, you know, Apollo has a pretty amazing. I mean, the Blackstone is a pretty amazing track record overall they've had a little bit of a hiccup here with this uh, and if their investors were a little more patient i'm sure it would work out but you know uh they they got to do what they got to do i mean if their investors want their money back and they can get it uh then they should get their money back and you know that sometimes they gate these things and make it more difficult and everybody gets surety with one another um you know uh investing is not without risk <laughs> To be continued on that as the cycle continues to turn. Uh, I would, I, I could, uh, as I'm sure everyone can tell, I could talk to you all afternoon, but uh, we're out of time. And and I, I again wanted to thank you just for uh, for taking the time. I mean, it's like really cool to have this conversation. I don't think that I don't think I'll have another one like it uh, at the 11th you know, Hedge Eye Investing Summit because because again, you're one of a kind, and and that's a testament to you. That's gonna you know. When we're all on the wrong side of the grass, I hope I hope people strive to have that kind of credibility. So, so thanks, man. Well, it's, it's, thank you very much, Keith. I really enjoyed it. And uh, you know, you, your your Mark Cahodes interview is uh, stands out for one of the most exceptional uh, that have occurred in the last few years. So, congratulations to you too. Cool. I appreciate that. And and I also appreciate that Bill's hair, like if I can kind of like go to where he's at in life and Mike, I can kind of get that to that kind of a look with that kind of. That guy's, that, that guy's looking good. He was great. Thanks for joining us today. Looking forward to tomorrow. Uh, we'll do it three more times.